Project Ledge X1. You've already seen it go from stock to stage one and then to stage two where it was already impressive. Now you get your first look at how it's equipped today. A few different parts and me parting with lots of my money. This is Project Ledge X1 Stage 3. For this stage, I went outside my normal self-imposed budgetary constraints because I normally like to keep my upgrades realistic, but for this build, I'm addressing the question of does more money invested result in an equal increase in performance? And if this is even a good idea. I also want to pause here for a second to tell you that there is a link or links down in the description not only for the parts that I used in this build but also a link to my previous videos that will get you caught up to this point because I'll be referencing some of the stuff from my previous builds like my fun setup. And this may look like the same setup as I had in stage 2 but it is different. Partly because my original plans for this didn't work out. You'll see why in just a moment. But what's here now is the same model bars as my fun 31.8 millimeter diameter bars, but now these are wider. How did I make bars wider, you may ask? Well, I ordered a duplicate set and then trimmed off less. 740 millimeters wide this time, and that puts everything right where I wanted and where I thought I was getting it on the first go round. All the other fun top-end components carryovers from stage 2 like the headset, the stem, and the matching grips. So to the bar complements like the shifter, the brake controls, and the dropper remote. I also kept the X-Fusion dropper, it's the best of the four that I've tested up to this point, and other than the bars, along with that headset, the entire fun kit made its way from stage 2 to stage 3 along with the IXF crankset. All of those parts have proven themselves worthy of making the cut and on a frame that itself is working well above its big box heritage and doing so without an issue. Which also means I kept the rear of this drivetrain Advent X the best you can buy for the money, in my opinion. A few of the new changes, easy to spot if you followed this project, like the fact that I somewhat rebranded the bike. No more Mongoose Head 2 badge, I replaced it with a holographic Kev Central sticker. And by the time you see this, it won't have any air bubbles in it, and I think this totally works with the color scheme of the bike, and shameless plug, you too can have your very own sticker like this. Link in the description. And that's not the only new sticker, because technically the all-mountain frame protectors are stickers, at least they stick on the bike, and a nice matching orange for the chainstay. All-mountain protection on the top tube as well, where I not only jazzed up the aesthetic, but also covered up an earlier paint chip that turned into a huge paint chip that you'll see in a moment. Stage 3, it's more than just stickers and handlebars, right? Oh yeah, you hear that? No, you don't hear anything, because that's the lack of jingle from the coins I no longer have in my pocket. I spent all that money on parts like this new fork, a little debonair class, which gives it that extra bit of air cush. I wanted to stick with 140 millimeters of travel for the fork, and initially I planned on using a Fox float, but I couldn't find the model that I wanted, and then I stumbled onto this, a RockShox Revelation. A worthy choice in my opinion, it gives everything that I wanted, plus a beefed up art support that accommodates the 2.60 tires with plenty of clearance. Another change brought on with this fork is the axle. We've seen this bike go from quick release to 15 by 100 through axle, now boosted to 15 by 110 a maxle even more strength and the need for a new hub to match which i also have up front it's not just the hub it's an entirely new wheel and these may look like the same bond trigger wheels from stage two at first glance and they're wrapped with the same continental mountain king 2.6 tires and i'm also running them as tubeless but this time the wheels are carbon stage two i had bond trigger alloy line comp 30 now a mismatch of sorts carbon line elite 30 up front and a fancy anodized orange valve stem cap from that to a carbon line pro 30 at the rear why go from elite to pro for this set that would be due to the rear spacing which is 135 millimeters and it turns out finding a quality carbon wheel set with 30 millimeter rims and 135 millimeter spacing difficult how did i do it the local bike shop came to the rescue using some of what I already had. They took the rear hub from the Bontrager alloy wheel set and put that on a new carbon rim. The only carbon rim we could locate, hence the Line Pro 30. And voila, a new wheel set, visually a match, sands the spoke nipple color slightly off, so one and one and a half wheel set makes a complete carbon wheel set, or at least with a rear 135 quick release. 
More changes, anodized orange rotor bolts. I figure since I'm upping the front rotor to this corky 180 millimeter, why not indulge in some new eye candy? I did keep the 160 mongoose rotor at the rear and its silver rotor bolts, you'll see why. New RockShox fork up front, it just didn't seem right to go this far and not match that up at the rear. So a RockShox here too, a RockShox Monarch RL. There was a balance to the force in Star Wars. This combo brings balance to the mongoose ledge. But there was a bit of a struggle getting there because the footage you're seeing here, this was a placeholder using the factory mounts. But the Monarch has one half inch eyelets and that's larger than the factory mounts, so there is play. That's not good. But I'm resourceful and in the interim, I used the DNM, which turned out to be a good thing because I was able to use the new fork with the DNM and then transition to the Monarch arc to feel the difference. And the difference is, well first a quick recap. This of course as I've mentioned a RockShox Monarch RL. It has the same or it's rated at the same 38 millimeters of suspension stroke and 165 millimeter eye to eye measurement just like the DNM except the DNM you never get a full 38 millimeters. But again and this is important the RockShox eye is larger than the factory hardware which works with the DNM so a kit has to be purchased. It's 32 bucks for the top and the bottom, but it adapts this shock perfectly. Now the DNM is pretty good for what it is, so what can this shock bring that's worth three times the price, actually over three times the price? RockShox brings more finesse per dollar. For example, a DNM, you use it until it breaks and then you just get a new one. The Monarch can be rebuilt. It even comes with a 50 hour service kit. And that's a big deal if you want to reduce your footprint or you just don't like the idea of replacing an entire shock for one small seal. Another plus for the Rock Shocks, it can handle pressures up to 275 PSI. That enhances its tunability and terrain capability. And as I've already mentioned, it balances out so well with that revelation up front which I do like and I think is underpriced. It comes in at around $500. It has less lateral flex than the fork I used before this and a lot better tire clearance. Plus, when paired with these carbon wheels, you could say there are improvements all around. Yeah, improvements all around. If I sound a little unsure, like I'm trying to convince myself, it's because I am. Now don't get me wrong, this is undeniably a great setup. I've had five riders ride this bike to rave reviews. And that makes sense because as a whole, a great package. And there are so many things that stand out. Like before, I didn't like the 720 millimeter bar accident. Now there's 740, a perfect fit. I call it ultra fun. And the front brake, now 180 millimeter rotor up front, and that's a good improvement, noticeable. All my stage two parts, the ones that I carried over here into stage three, very worthy of the carryover. They worked so well that they work at this level, and that's really good. Plus, anything with the Kev Central sticker on the head tube surely increases in value at least the cost of these parts, right? Seriously though, I really do wonder, because this is a better bike, but is it really that much better to be worth the extra money that I've spent on this? Because let's look at what I had versus what I have money-wise. Let's talk about Stage 2, which was completely usable. There's not much that I think this bike could do over what Stage 2 could do. We'll just do it smoother and with more finesse. But stage 2 on its own was pretty good. And I'll have to go back and look at my stage 2 video and you can correct me and put it down in the description. But I think I spent around $1,600, almost $1,700 on stage 2. And that made a capable bike that was 32 pounds fully acceptable for a full suspension mountain bike. For this stage 3 build, I spent $1,500 just for the wheels. $500 for that front suspension fork. $310 for the rear shock if you count the mounting hardware. And that did get me better performance, but how much? Much better per dollar. I'm having a hard time with that. And weight savings, all that money, I saved four tenths of a pound. So you see my dilemma. And also, let me talk about my fails. I don't usually talk about those, but I had a few. I've already talked about the pivot system mounts and the fail there. But the bars, these are 31.8 bars, just like the ones I had on stage two. I planned on using 35 millimeter versions of this bar for stage three. I bought them and the matching 35 millimeter stem unfortunately and for whatever reason the same fun bars and stem at 35 millimeter don't match each other. Not even close and this is very frustrating especially from a brand that I like and odd since the new stems still perfectly match the new 31.8 bars. 
I also missed on these orange rotor bolts. You know, think about this. I spent $1,500 for wheels, $810 for a fork and rear suspension shock, and then $8 for the critical hold rotor on the wheel bolts. But as you saw, cheap gets poor quality control and one red bolt, hence the silver factory bolts on the rear rotor. Even a slight failure on one of my big budget parts, this nice fork, the debonair ride, but the rebound adjustment knob gone after the first ride. Then there's my all mountain protection. Now to be fair, I did plan on doing this since stage one, but I didn't expect that my chip covering Kev's central sticker would turn against me and pull off a huge chunk of paint. I guess I should have expected it, but it's the reason that I have this staggered arrow top tube graphic, which for a cover up, I think works pretty good. This all sounds like I'm being negative about this bike, but I'm really not because Stage 3 is absolutely a great bike. It's impressed everyone that's ridden it, and I think if I remove the Mongoose branding from the side, I could fool a lot of bike snobs. The biggest takeaway from this for me is that all this extra money, and I ended up with a bike that went from 32 pounds to 31.6. I almost spent a thousand more for Fox parts and I'm so glad I didn't. I think if I had this to do over again, I would make the bike exactly like it is here, minus the carbon wheels, and just pocket that 1500 More expensive parts does not guarantee a one-to-one -one correlation with better performance. Here at Kev Central, we're budget bike riders, and our upgrades should maximize bang per buck. That's how we do it. We don't run around bragging about having the most expensive big box bike, because that's kind of stupid in my opinion. I will certainly try to keep budget in mind from here on with my project bikes. I don't know, what do you think? Both about this and the cost of upgrades. Should the sky be the limit or should it be budget for budget bikes? Comment below. Thanks for watching Kev Central and have a great day.